Traits and Stories of the Huguenots by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 194, 10th of December, 1853. I have always been interested in the conversation of anyone who could tell me anything about the Huguenots, and little by little I have picked up many fragments of information respecting them. I will just recur to the well-known fact that, five years after Henri IV's formal abjuration of the Protestant faith in 1593, he secured to the French Protestants their religious liberty by the Edict of Nantes. His unworthy son, however, Louis the Thirteenth, refused them the privileges which had been granted to them by this act, and when reminded of the claims they had, if the promises of Henry the Third and Henry the Fourth were to be regarded, he answered that the first-named monarch feared them and the latter loved them. The extermination of the Huguenots was a favourite project with Cardinal Richelieu, and it was at his instigation that the second siege of Rochelle was undertaken known even to the most careless student of history for the horrors of famine which the besieged endured. Miserably disappointed as they were at the failure of the looked-for assistance from England, the mayor of the town, Guiton, rejected the conditions of peace which Cardinal Richelieu offered, namely that they would raise their fortifications to the ground and suffer the Catholics to enter. But there was a traitorous faction in the town, and on Guiton's rejection of the terms. This faction collected in one night a crowd of women and children and aged persons, and drove them beyond the city lines. They were useless, and yet they ate food. Driven out from the beloved city, tottering, faint and weary, they were fired at by the enemy, and the survivors came pleading back to the walls of Rochelle, pleading for a quiet shelter to die in, even if their death were caused by hunger. When two-thirds of the inhabitants had perished, when the survivors were insufficient to bury their dead, when ghastly corpses outnumbered the living, miserable, glorious Rochelle, stronghold of the Huguenots, opened its gates to receive the Roman Catholic Cardinal, who celebrated Mass in the Church of San Marguerite, once the beloved sanctuary of Protestant worship. As we cling to the memory of the dead, so did the Huguenots remember Rochelle. Years, long years of suffering, gone by, a village sprang up, not twenty miles from New York, and the name of that village was New Rochelle, and the old men told with tears of the sufferings their parents had undergone when they were little children, far away across the sea, in the pleasant land of France. Richelieu was otherwise occupied after this second siege of Rochelle, and had to put his schemes for the extermination of the Huguenots on one side. So they lived in a kind of trembling, uncertain peace during the remainder of the reign of Louis the Thirteenth, But they strove to avert persecution by untiring submission. It was not until 1683 that the Huguenots of the south of France resolved to profess their religion, and refused any longer to be registered among those of the Roman Catholic faith, to be martyrs rather than apostates or hypocrites. On an appointed Sabbath, the old deserted Huguenot churches were reopened. Nay, those in ruins, of which but a few stones remain to tell the tale of having once been holy ground, were peopled with attentive hearers, listening to the word of God as preached by reformed ministers. Languedoc, the Cévennes, Dauphiny, seemed alive with Huguenots, even as the Highlands were, at the chieftain's call, alive with armed men, whose tartans had been hidden but a moment before in the harmonious and blending colours of the heather. Dragonades took place, and cruelties were perpetrated, which it is as well, for the honour of human nature, should be forgotten. 24,000 conversions were announced to Le Grand Louis, who fully believed in them. The more far-seeing Madame de Maintenon hinted at her doubts in the famous speech, 
Even if the fathers are hypocrites, the children will be Catholics. And then came the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. A multitude of weak reasons were alleged, as is generally the case where there is not one that is really good or presentable, such as that the Edict was never meant to be perpetual, that, by the blessing of heaven and the Dragonades, the Huguenots had returned to the true faith. Therefore the Edict was useless, a mere matter of form, etc., etc., as a mere matter of form, some penalties were decreed against the professors of the extinct heresy. Every Huguenot place of worship was to be destroyed. Every minister who refused to conform was to be sent to the Hôpitaux des Fossats at Marseille and at Valence. If he had been noted for his zeal, he was to be considered obstinate and sent to slavery for life in such of the West Indian islands as belonged to the French. The children of Huguenot parents were to be taken from them by force and educated by the Roman Catholic monks or nuns. These are but a few of the enactments contained in the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. And now come in some of the traditions which I have heard and collected. A friend of mine, a descendant from some of the Huguenot, who succeeded in emigrating to England, has told me the following particulars of her great-great-grandmother's escape. This lady's father was a Norman farmer, or rather, small landed proprietor. His name was Lefebvre. He had two sons, grown men stout and true, able to protect themselves and choose their own line of conduct. But he also had one little daughter, Magdalene, the child of his old age, and the darling of his house keeping it alive and glad with her innocent prattle. His small estate was far away from any large town, with its cornfields and orchards surrounding the old ancestral house. There was plenty always in it, and though the wife was an invalid, there was always a sober cheerfulness present, to give a charm to the abundance. The family Lefebvre lived almost entirely on the produce of the estate, and had little need for much communication with their nearest neighbours, with whom, however, as kindly, well-meaning people, they were on good terms, although they differed in their religion. In those days, coffee was scarcely known, even in large cities. Honey supplied the place of sugar, and for the pottage, the bouilli, the vegetables, the salad, the fruit, the garden, farm and orchards of the Lefebvre, was all sufficient. The woollen cloth was spun by the men of the house on winter's evenings, standing by the great wheel and carefully and slowly turning it to secure evenness of thread. The women took charge of the linen, gathering and drying and beating the bad-smelling hemp, the ugliest crop that grew about the farm, and reserving the delicate blue-flowered flax for the fine thread needed for the daughter's trousseau. For as soon as a woman child was born, the mother, lying too faint to work, smiled as she planned the web of dainty linen, which was to be woven at Rouen, out of the flaxen thread of gossamer fineness, to be spun by no hands, as you may guess, but that mother's own. And the farm maidens took pride in the store of sheets and table napery which they were to have a share in preparing, for the future wedding of the little baby, sleeping serene in her warm cot by her mother's side. Such being the self-sufficient habits of the Norman farmers, it was no wonder that in the eventful year of 1685, Lefebvre remained ignorant for many days of the revocation which was stirring the whole souls of his co-religionists. But there was to be a cattle fair at Avranches, and he needed a barren cow to fatten up and salt for the winter's provision. Accordingly, the large-boned Norman horse was accoutred, summer as it was, with all its paraphernalia of high-peaked wooden saddle, blue sheepskin, scarlet worsted fringe and tassels, and the farmer Lefebvre, slightly stiff in his limbs after sixty winters, got on from the horse-block by the stable wall, his little daughter Magdalen, nodding and kissing her hand as he rode away. When he arrived at the fair, 
in the great place before the cathedral in Avranches, he was struck with the absence of many of those who were united to him by the bond of their common persecuted religion. And on the faces of the Huguenot farmers who were there was an expression of gloom and sadness. In answer to his inquiries, he learnt, for the first time, of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. He and his son could sacrifice anything, would be proud of martyrdom if need were, but the clause which cut him to the heart was that which threatened that his pretty, innocent, sweet Magdalene might be taken from him and consigned to the teachings of a convent. A convent to the Huguenots excited prejudices, implied a place of dissolute morals as well as of idolatrous doctrine. Poor farmer Lefebvre thought no more of the cow he went to purchase. The life and death, nay, the salvation or damnation of his darling, seemed to him to depend on the speed with which he could reach his home and take measures for her safety. What these were to be he could not tell in this moment of bewildered terror, for even while he watched the stable boy at the inn arranging his horse's gear, without daring to help him, for fear his early departure and undue haste might excite suspicion in the malignant faces he saw gathering about him. Even while he trembled with impatience, his daughter might be carried away out of his sight for ever and ever. He mounted and spurred the old horse, but the road was hilly and the steed had not had his accustomed rest and was poorly fed according to the habit of the country and at last he almost stood still at the foot of every piece of rising ground. Farmer Lefebvre dismounted and ran by the horse's side up every hill, pulling him along and encouraging his flagging speed by every conceivable noise meant to be cheerful, though the tears were fast running down the old man's cheeks. He was almost sick with the revulsion of his fears when he saw Magdalen sitting out in the sun, playing with the fromage of the mallow plant, which is such a delight to Norman children. He got off his horse, which found its accustomed way into the stable. He kissed Magdalen over and over again, the tears coming down his cheeks like rain. And then he went in to tell his wife, his poor invalid wife. She received the news more tranquilly than he had done, Long illness had deadened the joys and fears of this world to her. She could even think and suggest. That night a fishing smack was to sail from Granville to the Channel Islands. Some of the people who had called at the Lefebvre farm on their way to Avranche had told her of ventures they were making in sending over apples and pears to be sold in Jersey where the orchard crops had failed. The captain was a friend of one of her absent sons for his sake. But we must part from her, from Magdalene, the apple of our eyes. And she, she has never left her home before, never been away from us. Who will take care of her? Marie, I say, who is to take care of the precious child? And the old man was choked with his sobs. Then his wife made answer and said, God will take care of our precious child and keep her safe from harm, till we too, or you at least, dear husband, can leave this accursed land. Or, if we cannot follow her, she will be safe for heaven, whereas if she stays here to be taken to the terrible convent, hell will be her portion, and we shall never see her again, never. So they were stilled by their faith into sufficient composure to plan for the little girl. The old horse was again to be harnessed and put into the cart and if any spying Romanist looked into the cart, what would they see but straw, and a new mattress rolled up, and peeping out of a sackcloth covering? The mother blessed her child, with a full conviction that she should never see her again. The father went with her to Granville. On the way, the only relief he had was caring for her comfort in her strange imprisonment. He stroked her cheeks and smoothed her hair with his labour-hardened fingers and coaxed her to eat the food her mother had prepared. In the evening her feet were cold. He took off his warm flannel jacket to wrap them in. Whether it was that chill coming on the heat of the excited day 
or whether the fatigue and grief broke down the old man utterly, no one can say. The child Magdalen was safely extricated from her hiding place at the quay at Gonville and smuggled on board of the fishing smack with her great chest of clothes and half-collected trousseau. The captain took her safe to Jersey, and willing friends received her eventually in London. But the father, moaning to himself, If I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved, saying that pitiful sentence over and over again, as if the repetition could charm away the deep sense of woe, went home and took to his bed and died. Nor did the mother remain long after him. One of these Lefebvre sons was the grandfather of the Duke of Danzig, one of Napoleon's marshals. The little daughter's descendants, though not very numerous, are scattered over England, and one of them, as I have said, is the lady who told me this, and many other particulars relating to the exiled Huguenots. At first the rigorous decrees of the revocation were principally enforced against the ministers of religion. They were all required to leave Paris at 48 hours' notice, under severe penalties for disobedience. Some of the most distinguished among them were ignominiously forced to leave the country, but the expulsion of these ministers was followed by the emigration of the more faithful among their people. In Languedoc this was especially the case. Whole congregations followed their pastors, and France was being rapidly drained of the more thoughtful and intelligent of the Huguenots, who, as a people, had distinguished themselves in manufacture and commerce. When the king's minister took the alarm and prohibited emigration under pain of imprisonment for life, imprisonment for life, including abandonment to the tender mercies of the priests. Here again I may relate an anecdote told me by my friend. A husband and wife attempted to escape separately from some town in Brittany. The wife succeeded and reached England, where she anxiously awaited her husband. The husband was arrested in the attempt and imprisoned. The priest alone was allowed to visit him, and after vainly using argument to endeavour to persuade him to renounce his obnoxious religion, the priest, with cruel zeal, had recourse to physical torture. There was a room in the prison with an iron floor and no seat, nor means of support or rest. Into this room the poor Huguenot was introduced. The iron flooring was gradually heated. One remembers the gouty gentleman whose cure was effected by a similar process in Sandford and Merton, but there the heat was not carried up to torture, as it was in the Huguenot's case. Still, the brave man was faithful. The process was repeated, all in vain. The flesh on the soles of his feet was burnt off, and he was a cripple for life. But, cripple or sound, dead or alive, a Huguenot he remained. And by and by, they grew weary of their useless cruelty, and the poor man was allowed to hobble about on crutches. How it was that he obtained his liberty at last, my informant could not tell. He only knew that, after years of imprisonment and torture, a poor grey cripple was seen wandering about the streets of London, making vain inquiries for his wife in his broken English, as little understood by most as the Moorish maiden's cry, For Gilbert, Gilbert! Someone at last directed him to a coffee-house near Soho Square, kept by an emigrant who thrived upon the art, even then national, of making good coffee. It was the resort of the Huguenots, many of whom by this time had turned their intelligence to good account in busy commercial England. To this coffee-house the poor cripple hide himself, but no one knew of his wife. She might be alive or she might be dead. It seemed as if her name had vanished from the earth. In the corner sat a peddler listening to everything, but saying nothing. He had come to London to lay in a stock of wares for his rounds. Now the three harbours of the French emigrants were Norwich, where they established the manufacture of Norwich crepe, Spitalfields in London, where they embarked in the silk trade, and Canterbury, 
where a colony of them carried on one or two delicate employments, such as jewellery, wax bleaching, etc. The peddler took Canterbury in his way, and sought among the French residents for a woman who might correspond to the missing wife. She was there, earning her livelihood as a milliner, and believing her husband to be either a galley slave or dead long since in some of the terrible prisons. But on hearing the peddler's tale, she set off at once to London, and found her poor crippled husband, who lived many years afterwards in Canterbury, supported by his wife's exertions. Another Huguenot couple determined to emigrate. They could disguise themselves, but their baby, if they were seen passing through the gates of the town in which they lived, with a child, they would instantly be arrested, suspected Huguenots as they were. Their expedient was to wrap the baby into a formless bundle, to one end of which was attached a string, and then, taking advantage of the deep gutter which runs in the centre of so many old streets in French towns, they placed the baby in this hollow, close to one of the gates after dusk. The gendarme came out to open the gate to them. They were suddenly summoned to see a sick relation, they said. They were known to have an infant child, which no Huguenot mother would willingly leave behind to be brought up by papists. So the sentinel concluded that they were not going to emigrate, at least this time, and locking the great town gates behind them, he re-entered his little guard-room. Now, quick, quick, the string under the gate, catch it with your hook-stick, there in the shadow, there, thank God, the baby is safe, it has not cried, pray God the sleeping draught be not too strong. It was not too strong. Father, mother and babe escaped to England, and their descendants may be reading this very paper. England, Holland and the Protestant states of Germany were the places of refuge for the Norman and Breton Protestants. From the south of France, escape was much more difficult. Algerine pirates infested the Mediterranean, and the small vessels in which many of the Huguenots embarked from the southern ports were an easy prey. There were Huguenot slaves in Algiers and Tripoli for years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Most Catholic Spain caught some of the fugitives who were welcomed by the Spanish Inquisition with a different kind of greeting from that which the wise, far-seeing William III of England bestowed on such of them as sought English shelter after his accession. We will return to the conditions of the English Huguenots presently. First, let us follow the fortunes of those French Protestants who sent a letter to the state of Massachusetts, among whose historical papers it is still extant, giving an account of the persecutions to which they were exposed and the distress they were undergoing, stating the wish of many of them to emigrate to America, and asking how far they might have privileges allowed them for following out their pursuit of agriculture. What answer was returned may be guessed from the fact that a tract of land comprising about 11,000 acres at Oxford near the present town of Worcester, Massachusetts, was granted to 30 Huguenots who were invited to come over and settle there. The invitation came like a sudden summons to a land of hope across the Atlantic. There was no time for preparations. These might excite suspicion. They left the pot boiling on the fire to use the expression of one of their descendants, and carried no clothes with them but what they wore. The New Englanders had too lately escaped from religious persecution themselves, not to welcome and shelter and clothe these poor refugees when they once arrived at Boston. The little French colony at Oxford was called a plantation, and Gabriel Bernon, a descendant of a knightly name in Foissart, a Protestant merchant of Rochelle, was appointed undertaker for this settlement. They sent for a French Protestant minister and assigned to him a salary of £40 a year. They bent themselves assiduously to the task of cultivating the half-cleared land on the borders of which lay the dark forest, among which the Indians prowled and lurked, ready to spring upon the unguarded households. To protect themselves from this creeping deadly enemy, the French built a fort, traces of which yet remain. 
but on the murder of the Johnson family, the French dared no longer remain on the bloody spot, although more than ten acres of ground were in garden cultivation around the fort. And long afterwards, those who told in hushed, awestruck voices of the Johnson murder could point to the rose bushes, the apple and pear trees, yet standing in the Frenchman's deserted gardens. Mrs. Johnson was a sister of Andrew Sigourney, one of the first Huguenots who came over. He saved his sister's life by dragging her by main force through a back door while the Indians massacred her children and shot down her husband at his own threshold. To preserve her life was but a cruel kindness. Gabriel Bernon lived to a patriarchal age in spite of his early sufferings in France and the wild Indian cries of revenge around his home in Massachusetts. He died rich and prosperous. He had kissed Queen Anne's hand and become intimate with some of the English nobility, such as Lord Archdale, the Quaker governor of Carolina, who had lands and governments in the American states. The descendants of the Huguenot refugees repaid in part their debt of gratitude to Massachusetts in various ways during the War of Independence. 1. Gabriel Manigault, by advancing a large loan to further the objects of it. Indeed, three of the nine presidents of the old Congress, which conducted the United States through the Revolutionary War, were descendants of the French Protestant refugees. General Francis Marion, who fought bravely under Washington, was of Huguenot descent. In fact, both in England and France, the Huguenot refugees showed themselves temperate, industrious, thoughtful and intelligent people, full of good principle and strength of character. But all this is implied in the one circumstance that they suffered and emigrated to secure the rights of conscience. In the state of New York, they fondly called their plantation or settlement by the name of the precious city which had been their stronghold and where they had suffered so much. New Rochelle was built on the shore of Long Island Sound, 23 miles from New York. On the Saturday afternoons, the inhabitants of New Rochelle harnessed their horses to their carts to convey the women and little ones. And the men in the prime of life walked all the distance to New York, camping out in their carts in the environs of the city, through the night till the bell summoned them on Sunday morning to service in the old church du Saint-Esprit. In the same way they returned on Sunday evening. The old longing for home recorded in Alan Cunningham's ballad, It's hame, it's hame, hame fain would I be, O hame, hame, hame to my ain country, clung to the breasts and caused singular melancholy in some of them. There was one old man who went every day down to the seashore to look and gaze his fill towards the beautiful cruel land where most of his life had been passed. With his face to the east, his eyes strained as if by force of longing looks he could see the far distant France. He said his morning prayers and sang one of Clement Marot's hymns. There had been an edition of the Psalms of David put into French rhyme Somme de David, mise en rime Françoise par Clément Marot et Théodore de Bez, published in as small a form as possible in order that the book might be concealed in their bosoms, if the Huguenots were surprised in their worship while they lived in France. Nor were Oxford and New Rochelle the only settlements of the Huguenots in the United States. Farther south again, they were welcomed, and found resting places in Virginia and South Carolina. I now return to the Huguenots in England. Even during James II's reign, collections were made for the refugees, and in the reign of his successor, £15,000 were voted by Parliament to be distributed among persons of quality, and all such as by age or infirmity were unable to support themselves. There are still or were not many years ago, a few survivors of the old Huguenot stock who go on quarter day to claim their small benefits from this fund at the Treasury. 
and doubtless at the time it was granted there were many friendless and helpless to whom the little pensions were inestimable boons but the greater part were active strong men full of good sense and practical talent and they preferred taking advantage of the national goodwill in a more independent form their descendants bear honoured names among us sir samuel romilly mrs austin and mrs harriet martineau are three of those that come most prominently before me as i write but each of these names are suggestive of others in the same families worthy of note sir samuel romilly's ancestors came from the south of france where the paternal estate fell to a distant relation rather than to the son because the former was a catholic while the latter had preferred a foreign country with freedom to worship god in sir samuel romilly's account of his father and grandfather it is easy to detect the southern character predominating most affectionate and impulsive generous carried away by transports of anger and of grief tender and true in all his relationships the reader does not easily forget the father of sir samuel romilly with his fond adoption of montaigne's idea playing on a flute by the side of his daughter's bed in order to waken her in the morning no wonder he himself was so beloved but there was much more demonstration of affection in all these french households if what i have gathered from their descendants be correct than we english should ever dare to manifest french was the language still spoken among themselves sixty and seventy years after their ancestors had quitted france in the romilly family the father established it as a rule that french should always be spoken on a sunday forty years later the lady to whom i have so often alluded was living an orphan child with two maiden aunts in the heart of london city they always spoke french english was the foreign language and a certain pride was cultivated in the little damsel's mind by the fact of her being reminded every now and then that she was a little french girl bound to be polite gentle and attentive in manners to stand till her elders gave her leave to sit down to curtsy on entering or leaving a room she attended her relations to the early markets near spitalfields where many herbs not in general use in england and some weeds were habitually brought by the market women for the use of the french people burnet cherville dandelion were amongst the number in order to form the salads which were a principal dish at meals there were still hereditary schools in the neighbourhood kept by the descendants of the first refugees who established them and to which the huguenot families still sent their children a kind of correspondence was occasionally kept up with the unseen and distant relations in france third or fourth cousins it might be as was to be expected such correspondence languished and died by slow degrees but tales of their ancestors sufferings and escapes beguiled the long winter evenings though far away from france though cast off by her a hundred years before the gentle old ladies who had lived all their lives in london considered france as their country and england as a strange land upstairs too was a great chest the very chest magdalene lefevre had had packed to accompany her in her flight and escape in the mattress the stores her fond mother had provided for her trousseau were not yet exhausted though she slept in her grave and out of them her little orphan descendant was dressed and when the quaintness of the pattern made the child shrink from putting on so peculiar a dress she was asked are you not a little french girl you ought to be proud of wearing a french print there are none like it in england in all this her relations and their circle seem to have differed from the refugee friends of old mr romilly who we are told desired nothing less than to preserve the memory of their origin and their chapels were therefore ill attended a large uncouth room the avenues to which were narrow courts and dirty alleys with irregular unpainted pews and dusty unplastered walls a congregation consisting principally of some strange-looking old women scattered here and there etc probably these old ladies looked strange to the child 
who recorded these early impressions in afterlife, because they clung with fond pride to the dress of their ancestors, and decked themselves out in the rich grotesque raiment which had formed part of their mother's trousseau. At any rate, there certainly was a little colony in the heart of the city at the end of the last century, who took pride in their descent from the suffering Huguenots, who mustered up relics of the old homes and the old times in Normandy or Languedoc. A sword wielded by some great grandfather in the wars of the League, a gold whistle such as hung ever ready at the master's girdle, before bells were known in houses, or ready to summon out of doors labourers. Some of the very ornaments sold at the famous curiosity shop at Warwick for ladies to hang at their Châtelaine, within this last ten years, were brought over by the flying Huguenots. And there were precious Bibles, secured by silver clasps and corners, strangely wrought silver spoons, the handle of which enclosed the bowl, a travelling case containing a gold knife, spoon and fork, and a crystal goblet on which the coat of arms was engraved in gold. All these and many other relics tell of the affluence and refinement the refugees left behind for the sake of their religion. There is yet an hospital, or rather great almshouse, for aged people of French descent, somewhere near the city road, which is supported by the proceeds of land bequeathed, I believe, by some of the first refugees who were prosperous in trade after settling in England but it has lost much of its distinctive national character. Fifty or sixty years ago, a visitor might have heard the inmates of this hospital chattering away in antiquated French. Now they speak English, for the majority of their ancestors in four generations have been English, and probably some of them do not know a word of French. Each inmate has a comfortable bedroom, a small annuity for clothes, etc., and sits and has meals in a public dining-room. As a little amusing mark of deference to the land of their founders, I may mention that a Mrs. Stevens, who was admitted within the last thirty years, became Madame Saint-Étienne as soon as she entered the hospital. I have now told all I know about the Huguenots. I pass the mark to someone else. End of Traits and Stories of the Huguenots by Elizabeth Gaskell Part 1 of My French Master by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, number 195, 17th of December, 1853. My French Master, in two chapters. Chapter the First. My father's house was in the country, seven miles away from the nearest town. He had been an officer in the Navy, but as he had met with some accidents, that would disable him from ever serving again, he gave up his commission and his half-pay. He had a small private fortune, and my mother had not been penniless, so he purchased a house and ten or twelve acres of land, and set himself up as an amateur farmer on a very small scale. My mother rejoiced over the very small scale of his operations, and when my father regretted, as he did very often, that no more land was to be purchased in the neighbourhood, I could see her setting herself a sum in her head. If on twelve acres he manages to lose a hundred pounds a year, what would be our loss on a hundred and fifty? But when my father was pushed hard on the subject of the money he spent in his sailor-like farming, he had one constant retreat. Think of the health and the pleasure we all of us take in the cultivation of the fields around us. It is something for us to do and to look forward to every day. And this was so true that as long as my father confined himself to these arguments, my mother left him unmolested. But to strangers he was still apt to enlarge on the returns his farm brought him in, 
and he had often to pull up in his statements when he caught the warning glance of my mother's eye showing him that she was not so much absorbed in her own conversation as to be deaf to his voice but as for the happiness that arose out of our mode of life that was not to be calculated by tens or hundreds of pounds there were only two of us my sister and myself and my mother undertook the greater part of our education we helped her in her household cares during part of the morning then came an old-fashioned routine of lessons such as she herself had learnt when a girl goldsmith's history of england Rowland's ancient history lindley murray's grammar and plenty of sewing and stitching my mother used sometimes to sigh and wish that she could buy us a piano and teach us what little music she knew but many of my dear father's habits were expensive at least for a person possessed of no larger an income than he had besides the quiet and unsuspected drain of his agricultural pursuits he was of a social turn enjoying the dinners to which he was invited by his more affluent neighbours and especially delighted in returning them the compliment and giving them choice little entertainments which would have been yet more frequent in their recurrence than they were but we never were able to purchase the piano it required a greater outlay of ready money than we ever possessed i dare say we should have grown up ignorant of any language but our own if it had not been for my father's social habits which led to our learning french in a very unexpected manner he and my mother went to dine with general ashburton one of the forest rangers and there they met with an emigrant gentleman a monsieur de chalabre who had escaped in a wonderful manner and at terrible peril to his life and was consequently in our small forest circle a great lion and a worthy cause of a series of dinner parties his first entertainer general ashburton had known him in france under very different circumstances and he was not prepared for the quiet and dignified request made by his guest one afternoon after m de chalabre had been about a fortnight in the forest that the general would recommend him as a french teacher if he could conscientiously do so to the general's remonstrances m de chalabre smilingly replied by an assurance that his assumption of his new occupation could only be for a short time that the good cause would must triumph it was before the fatal january twenty first seventeen hundred and ninety three and then still smiling he strengthened his position by quoting innumerable instances out of the classics of heroes and patriots generals and commanders who had been reduced by fortune's frolics to adopt some occupation far below their original one he closed his speech with informing the general that relying upon his kindness in acting as referee he had taken lodgings for a few months at a small farm which was in the centre of our forest circle of acquaintances the general was too thoroughly a gentleman to say anything more than that he should be most happy to do whatever he could to forward m de chalabre's plans and as my father was the first person whom he met with after his conversation it was announced to us on the very evening of the day on which it had taken place that we were forthwith to learn french and i verily believe that if my father could have persuaded my mother to join him we should have formed a french class of father mother and two head of daughters so touched had my father been by the general's account of m de chalabre's present desires as compared with the higher state from which he had fallen accordingly we were installed in the dignity of his first french pupils my father was anxious that we should have a lesson every other day ostensibly that we might get on all the more speedily but really that he might have a larger quarterly bill to pay at any rate until m de chalabre had more of his time occupied with instruction but my mother gently interfered and calmed her husband down into two lessons a week which was she said as much as we could manage those happy lessons i remember them now at the distance of more than fifty years 
our house was situated on the edge of the forest our fields were in fact cleared out of it it was not good land for clover but my father would always sow one particular field with clover seed because my mother was so fond of the fragrant scent in her evening walks and through this a footpath ran which led into the forest a quarter of a mile beyond a walk on the soft fine springy turf and under the long low branches of the beech trees and we arrived at the old red brick farm where m de chalabre was lodging not that we went there to take our lessons that would have been an offence to his spirit of politeness but as my father and mother were his nearest neighbours there was a constant interchange of small messages and notes which we little girls were only too happy to take to our dear m chalabre moreover if our lessons with my mother were ended pretty early she would say you have been good girls now you may run to the high point in the clover field and see if m de chalabre is coming and if he is you may walk with him but take care and give him the cleanest part of the path for you know he does not like to dirty his boots this was all very well in theory but like many theories the difficulty was to put it in practice if we slipped to the side of the path where the water lay longest he bowed and retreated behind us to a still wetter place leaving the clean part to us yet when we got home his polished boots would be without a speck while our shoes were covered with mud another little ceremony which we had to get accustomed to was his habit of taking off his hat as we approached and walking by us holding it in his hand to be sure he wore a wig delicately powdered frizzed and tied in a queue behind but we had always a feeling that he would catch cold and that he was doing us too great an honour and that he did not know how old or rather how young we were until one day we saw him far away from our house hand a countrywoman over a stile with the same kind of dainty courteous politeness lifting her basket of eggs over first and then taking up the silk lined lapel of his coat he spread it on the palm of his hand for her to rest her fingers upon instead of which she took his small white hand in her plump vigorous gripe and leant her full weight upon him he carried her basket for her as far as their roads lay together and from that time we were less shy in receiving his courtesies perceiving that he considered them as deference due to our sex however old or young or rich or poor so as i said we came down from the clover field in rather a stately manner and through the wicket gate that opened into our garden which was as rich in its scents of varied kinds as the clover field had been in its one pure fragrance my mother would meet us here and somehow our life was passed as much out of doors as indoors both winter and summer we seemed to have our french lessons more frequently in the garden than in the house for there was a sort of arbour on the lawn near the drawing-room window to which we always found it easy to carry a table and chairs and all the rest of the lesson paraphernalia if my mother did not prohibit a lesson al fresco m de chalabre wore as a sort of morning costume a coat waistcoat and breeches all made of a kind of coarse grey cloth which he had bought in the neighbourhood his three-cornered hat was brushed to a nicety his wig sat as no one else's did my father's was always awry and the only thing wanting to his costume when he came was a flower sometimes i fancied he purposely omitted gathering one of the roses that clustered up the farmhouse in which he lodged in order to afford my mother the pleasure of culling her choicest carnations and roses to make him up his nosegay or posy as he liked to call it he had picked up that pretty country word and adopted it as an especial favourite dwelling on the first syllable with all the languid softness of an italian accent many a time have mary and i tried to say it like him we did so admire his way of speaking once seated round the table whether in the house or out of it we were bound to attend to our lessons and somehow he made us perceive that it was a part of the same chivalrous code 
that made him so helpful to the helpless to enforce the slightest claim of duty to the full no half-prepared lessons for him the patience and the resource with which he illustrated and enforced every precept the untiring gentleness with which he made our stubborn english tongues pronounce and mispronounce and repronounce certain words above all the sweetness of temper which never varied were such as i have never seen equalled if we wondered at these qualities when we were children how much greater has been our surprise at their existence since we have been grown up and have learnt that until his emigration he was a man of rapid and impulsive action with the imperfect education implied in the circumstance that at fifteen he was a sous lieutenant in the queen's regiment and must consequently have had to apply himself hard and conscientiously to master the language which he had in after life to teach twice we had holidays to suit his sad convenience holidays with us were not at christmas and midsummer easter and michaelmas if my mother was unusually busy we had what we called a holiday though in reality it involved harder work than our regular lessons but we fetched and carried and ran errands and became rosy and dusty and sang merry songs in the gaiety of our hearts if the day was remarkably fine my dear father whose spirits were rather apt to vary with the weather would come bursting in with his bright kind bronzed face and carry the day by storm with my mother it was a shame to coop such young things up in a house he would say when every other young animal was frolicking in the air and sunshine grammar what was that but the art of arranging words and he never knew a woman but could do that fast enough geography he would undertake to teach us more geography in one winter evening telling us of the countries where he had been with just a map before him then we could learn in ten years with that stupid book all full of hard words as for the french why that must be learnt for he should not like monsieur de chalabre to think we slighted the lessons he took so much pains to give us but surely we could get up the earlier to learn our french we promised by acclamation and my mother sometimes smilingly sometimes reluctantly was always compelled to yield and these were the usual occasions for our holidays but twice we had a fortnight's entire cessation of french lessons once in january and once in october nor did we even see our dear french master during those periods we went several times to the top of the clover field to search the dark green outskirts of the forest with our busy eyes and if we could have seen his figure in that shade i am sure we should have scampered to him forgetful of the prohibition which made the forest forbidden ground but we did not see him it was the fashion in those days to keep children much less informed than they are now on the subjects which interest their parents a sort of hieroglyphic or cipher talk was used in order to conceal the meaning of much that was said if children were present my mother was a proficient in this way of talking and took we fancied a certain pleasure in perplexing my father by inventing a new cipher as it were every day for instance for some time i was called marcia because i was very tall of my age and just as my father had begun to understand the name and it must be owned a good while after i had learned to prick up my ears whenever marcia was named my mother suddenly changed me into the buttress from the habit i had acquired of leaning my languid length against a wall i saw my father's perplexity about this buttress for some days and could have helped him out of it but i durst not and so when the unfortunate louis the sixteenth was executed the news was too terrible to be put into plain english and too terrible also to be made known to us children nor could we at once find the clue to the cipher in which it was spoken about we heard about the iris being blown down and saw my father's honest loyal excitement about it and the quiet reserve which always betokened some secret grief on my mother's part 
we had no French lessons, and somehow the poor battered storm-torn Iris was to blame for this. It was many weeks after this before we knew the full reason of Monsieur de Chalabre's deep depression when he again came amongst us, why he shook his head when my mother timidly offered him some snowdrops on that first morning on which we began lessons again, why he wore the deep mourning of that day, when all of the dress that could be black was black, and the white muslin frills and ruffles were unstarched and limp, as if to bespeak the very abandonment of grief. We knew well enough the meaning of the next hieroglyphic announcement. The wicked, cruel boys had broken off the white lily's head. That beautiful queen, whose portrait had once been shown to us, with her blue eyes and her fair, resolute look, her profusion of lightly powdered hair, her white neck, adorned with strings of pearls. We could have cried if we had dared, when we heard the transparent, mysterious words. We did cry at night, sitting up in bed, with our arms around each other's necks, and vowing, in our weak, passionate, childish way, that if we lived long enough, that lady's death avenged should be. No one who cannot remember that time can tell the shudder of horror that thrilled through the country at hearing of this last execution. At the moment, there was no time for any consideration of the silent horrors endured for centuries by the people who at length rose in their madness against their rulers. This last blow changed our dear Monsieur de Chalabre. I never saw him again in quite the same gaiety of heart as before this time. There seemed to be tears very close behind his smiles for ever after. My father went to see him when he had been about a week absent from us. No reason given, for did not we, did not every one know the horror the son had looked upon? As soon as my father had gone, my mother gave it in charge to us to make the dressing-room belonging to our guest-chamber as much like a sitting-room as possible. My father hoped to bring back Monsieur de Chalabre for a visit to us, but he would probably like to be a good deal alone, and we might move any article of furniture we liked if we only thought it would make him comfortable. I believe General Ashburton had been on a somewhat similar errand to my father's before, but he had failed. My father gained his point, as I afterwards learnt, in a very unconscious and characteristic manner. He had urged his invitation on Monsieur de Chalabre, and received such a decided negative that he was hopeless and quitted the subject. Then Monsieur de Chalabre began to relieve his heart by telling him all the details. My father held his breath to listen. At last, his honest heart could contain itself no longer, and the tears ran down his face. His unaffected sympathy touched Monsieur de Chalabre inexpressibly, and in an hour after, we saw our dear French master coming down the Cloverfield slope, leaning on my father's arm, which he had involuntarily offered as a support to one in trouble, although he was slightly lame, and ten or fifteen years older than Monsieur de Chalabre. For a year after that time, Monsieur de Chalabre never wore any flowers, and after that, to the day of his death, no gay or coloured rose or carnation could tempt him. We secretly observed his taste, and always took care to bring him white flowers for his posy. I noticed, too, that on his left arm, under his coat sleeve, sleeves were made very open then, he always wore a small band of black crepe. He lived to be eighty-one, but he had the black crepe band on when he died. Monsieur de Chalabre was a favourite in all the forest circle. He was a great acquisition to the sociable dinner parties that were perpetually going on, and though some of the families piqued themselves on being aristocratic and turned up their noses at anyone who had been engaged in trade, however largely, Monsieur de Chalabre, in right of his good blood, his loyalty, his daring, pre-chevalier actions, was ever an honoured guest. He took his poverty and the simple habits it enforced, so naturally and gaily, 
as a mere trifling accident of his life, about which neither concealment nor shame could be necessary, that the very servants, often so much more pseudo-aristocratic than their masters, loved and respected the French gentleman, who perhaps came to teach in the mornings, and in the evenings, made his appearance dressed with dainty neatness as a dinner guest. He came, lightly prancing through the forest mire, and in our little hall, at any rate, he would pull out a neat, minute case, containing a blacking brush and blacking, and repolish his boots, speaking gaily in his broken English to the footman all the time. That blacking case was his own making. He had a genius for using his fingers. After our lessons were over, he relaxed into the familiar house friend, the merry playfellow. We lived far from any carpenter or joiner. If a lock was out of order, Monsieur de Chalabre made it right for us. If any box was wanted, his ingenious fingers had made it before our lesson day. He turned silk winders for my mother, made a set of chessmen for my father, carved an elegant watch-case out of a rough beef-bone, dressed up little cork dolls for us. In short, as he said, his heart would have been broken but for his joiner's tools. Nor were his ingenious gifts employed for us alone. The farmer's wife where he lodged had numerous contrivances in her house which he had made. One particularly which I remember was a pasteboard, made after a French pattern, which would not slip about on a dresser, as he had observed her English pasteboard do. Susan, the ruddy farmer's daughter, had her work-box, too, to show us, and her cousin lover had a wonderful stick with an extraordinary demon head carved upon it, all by Monsieur de Chalabre. Farmer, farmer's wife, Susan, Robert, and all were full of his praises. We grew from children into girls, from girls into women, and still Monsieur de Chalabre taught on in the forest. Still he was beloved and honoured. Still no dinner party within five miles was thought complete without him, and ten miles distance strove to offer him a bed sooner than miss his company. The pretty merry Susan of sixteen had been jilted by the faithless Robert, and was now a comely, demure damsel of thirty-one or two, still waiting upon Monsieur Chalabre, and still constant in respectfully singing his praises. My own poor mother was dead. My sister was engaged to be married to a young lieutenant who was with his ship in the Mediterranean. My father was as youthful as ever in heart, and indeed in many of his ways. Only his hair was quite white, and the old lameness was more frequently troublesome than it had been. An uncle of his had left him a considerable fortune, so he farmed away to his heart's content, and lost an annual sum of money with the best grace and the lightest heart in the world. There were not even the gentle reproaches of my mother's eyes to be dreaded now. Things were in this state when the peace of 1814 was declared. We had heard so many and such contradictory rumours that we were inclined to doubt even the Gazette at last, and were discussing probabilities with some vehemence, when M. de Chalabre entered the room, unannounced and breathless. "'My friends, give me joy,' he said. "'The Bourbon!' He could not go on. His features, nay, his very fingers, worked with agitation, but he could not speak. My father hastened to relieve him. We have heard the good news. You see, girls, it is quite true this time. I do congratulate you, my dear friend. I am glad. And he seized Monsieur de Chalabre's hand in his own hearty gripe, and brought the nervous agitation of the latter to a close, by unconsciously administering a pretty severe dose of wholesome pain. I go to London. I go straight this afternoon to see my sovereign. My sovereign holds a court tomorrow at Grion Hotel. I go to him. I go to pay my devoir. I put on my uniform of garde du corps, which I have laid by these many years. A little old, a little worm-eaten, but never mind. They have been seen by Marie Antoinette which gives them a grass for ever. 
he walked about the room in a nervous hurried way there was something on his mind and we signed to my father to be silent for a moment or two and let it come out no said monsieur de chalabre after a moment's pause i cannot say adieu for i shall return to say dear friends my adieu i did come a poor emigrant noble englishmen took me for their friend and welcomed me to their houses chalabre is one large mansion and my english friends will not forsake me they will come and see me in my own country and for their sakes not an english beggar shall pass the doors of chalabre without being warmed and clothed and fed i will not say adieu i go now but for two days End of chapter 1part two of my french master by elizabeth gaskell this librivox recording is in the public domain from household words a weekly journal number one hundred and ninety six twenty fourth of december eighteen fifty three my french master in two chapters chapter the second my father insisted upon driving monsieur de chalabre in his gig to the nearest town through which the london mail passed and during the short time that elapsed before my father was ready he told us something more about chalabre he had never spoken of his ancestral home to any of us before we knew little of his station in his own country general ashburton had met with him in paris in a set where a man was judged of by his wit and talent for society and general brilliance of character rather than by his wealth and hereditary position now we learned for the first time that he was heir to considerable estates in normandy to an old chateau chalabre all of which he had forfeited by his emigration it was true but that was under another regime ah if my dear friend your poor mother were alive now i could send her such slips of rare and splendid roses from chalabre often when i did see her nursing up some poor little specimen i longed in secret for my rose garden at chalabre and the orangery ah miss fanny the bride must come to chalabre who wishes for a beautiful wreath this was an allusion to my sister's engagement a fact well known to him as the faithful family friend my father came back in high spirits and began to plan that very evening how to arrange his crops for the ensuing year so as best to spare time for a visit to chateau chalabre and as for us i think we believed there was no need to delay our french journey beyond the autumn of the present year monsieur de chalabre came back in a couple of days a little damped we girls fancied though we hardly liked to speak about it to my father however m de chalabre explained it to us by saying that he had found london more crowded and busy than he had expected that it was smoky and dismal after leaving the country where the trees were already coming into leaf and when we pressed him a little more respecting the reception at grion he laughed at himself for having forgotten the tendency of the count de provence in former days to become stout and so being dismayed at the mass of corpulence which louis the eighteenth presented as he toiled up the long drawing-room of the hotel but what did he say to you fanny asked how did he receive you when you were presented a flash of pain passed over his face but it was gone directly oh his majesty did not recognise my name it was hardly to be expected he would though it is a name of note in normandy and i have well that is worth nothing the duc de Duras reminded him of a circumstance or two which i had almost hoped his majesty would not have forgotten but i myself forgot the pressure of long years of exile it was no wonder he did not remember me he said he hoped to see me at the tuileries his hopes are my laws i go to prepare for my departure if his majesty does not need my sword i turn it into a ploughshare at chalabre ah my friend i will not forget there all the agricultural science i have learned from you 
a gift of a hundred pounds would not have pleased my father so much as this last speech. He began forthwith to inquire about the nature of the soil, etc., in a way which made our poor Monsieur de Chalabre shrug his shoulders in despairing ignorance. "'Never mind,' said my father. "'Rome was not built in a day. It was a long time before I learned all that I know now. I was afraid I could not leave home this autumn, but I perceive you'll need someone to advise you about laying out the ground for next year's crops.' So Monsieur de Chalabre left our neighbourhood, with the full understanding that we were to pay him a visit in his Norman chateau in the following September. Nor was he content until he had persuaded everyone who had shown him kindness to promise him a visit at some appointed time. As for his old landlord at the farm, the comely dame and buxom Susan, they, we found, were to be franked there and back, under the pretence that the French dairymaids had no notion of cleanliness any more than that the French farming men were judges of stock. So it was absolutely necessary to bring over someone from England to put the affairs of the Chateau Chalabre in order, and Farmer Dobson and his wife considered the favour quite reciprocal. For some time we did not hear from our friend. The war had made the post between France and England very uncertain, so we were obliged to wait, and we tried to be patient. But somehow our autumn visit to France was silently given up, and my father gave us long expositions of the disordered state of affairs in a country which had suffered so much as France, and lectured us severely on the folly of having expected to hear so soon. We knew all the while that the exposition was repeated to soothe his own impatience, and that the admonition to patience was what he felt that he himself was needing. At last the letter came. There was a brave attempt at cheerfulness in it, which nearly made me cry more than any complaints would have done. Monsieur de Chalabre had hoped to retain his commission as sous-lieutenant in the Garde du Corps, a commission signed by Louis the Sixteenth himself, in 1791. But the regiment was to be remodelled or reformed, I forget which, and Monsieur de Chalabre assured us that his was not the only case where applicants had been refused. He had then tried for a commission in the Sainte Suisse, the Garde du Port, the Mousquetaire, but all were full. Was it not a glorious thing for France to have so many brave sons ready to fight on the side of honour and loyalty? To which question Fanny replied that it was a shame, and my father, after a grunt or two, comforted himself by saying that Monsieur de Chalabre would have the more time to attend to his neglected estate. That winter was full of incidents in our home, as it often happens when a family has seemed stationary and secure from change for years, and then, at last, one important event happens, another is sure to follow. Fanny's lover returned, and they were married, and left us alone, my father and I. Her husband's ship was stationed in the Mediterranean, and she was to go and live at Malta, with some of his relations there. I knew not if it was the agitation of parting with her, but my father was stricken down from health into confirmed invalidism by a paralytic stroke soon after her departure and my interests were confined to the fluctuating reports of a sick-room. I did not care for the foreign intelligence which was shaking Europe with an universal tremor. My hopes, my fears, were centred in one frail human body, my dearly beloved, my most loving father. I kept a letter in my pocket for days from Monsieur de Chalabre, unable to find the time to decipher his French hieroglyphics. At last I read it aloud to my poor father, rather as a test of his power of enduring interest than because I was impatient to know what it contained. The news in it was depressing enough, as everything else seemed to be that gloomy winter. A rich manufacturer of Rouen had bought the Chateau Chalabre, forfeited to the nation by its former possessor's emigration. His son, Monsieur Dufay, was well affected towards Louis the Eighteenth, at least as long as his government was secure and promised to be stable, so as not to affect the dyeing and selling of turkey-red wools. 
and so the natural legal consequence was that m dufay fils was not to be disturbed in his purchased and paid-for property my father cared to hear of this disappointment to our poor friend cared just for one day and forgot all about it the next then came the return from elba the hurrying events of that spring the battle of waterloo and to my poor father in his second childhood the choice of a daily pudding was far more important than all one sunday in that august of eighteen hundred and fifteen i went to church it was many weeks since i had been able to leave my father for so long a time before since i had been last there to worship it seemed as if my youth had passed away gone without a warning leaving no trace behind after service i went through the long grass to the unfrequented part of the churchyard where my dear mother lay buried a garland of brilliant yellow immortelle lay on her grave and the unwanted offering took me by surprise i knew of the foreign custom although i had never seen the kind of wreath before i took it up and read one word in the black floral letters it was simply adieu i knew from the first moment i saw it that m de chalabre must have returned to england such a token of regard was like him and could spring from no one else but i wondered a little that we had never heard or seen anything of him nothing in fact since lady ashburton had told me that her husband had met with him in belgium hurrying to offer himself as a volunteer to one of the eleven generals appointed by the duc de feltre to receive such applications general ashburton himself had since this died at brussels in consequence of wounds received at waterloo as the recollection of all these circumstances gathered in my mind i found i was drawing near the field path which led out of the direct road home to father dobson's and thither i suddenly determined to go and hear if they had heard anything respecting their former lodger as i went up the garden walk leading to the house i caught m de chalabre's eye he was gazing abstractedly out of the window of what used to be his sitting-room in an instant he had joined me in the garden if my youth had flown his youth and middle age as well had vanished altogether he looked older by at least twenty years than when he had left us twelve months ago how much of this was owing to the change in the arrangement of his dress i cannot tell he had formerly been remarkably dainty in all these things now he was careless even to the verge of slovenliness he asked after my sister after my father in a manner which evinced the deepest most respectful interest but somehow it appeared to me as if he hurried question after question rather to stop any inquiries which i in my turn might wish to make i return here to my duties to my only duties the good god has not seen me fit to undertake any higher henceforth i am the faithful french teacher the diligent punctual french teacher nothing more but i do hope to teach the french language as becomes a gentleman and a christian to do my best henceforth the grammar and syntax are my estate my coat of arms he said this with a proud humility which prevented any reply i could only change the subject and urge him to come and see my poor sick father he replied to visit the sick that is my duty as well as my pleasure for the mere society i renounce all that that is now beyond my position to which i accommodate myself with all my strength accordingly when he came to spend an hour with my father he brought a small bundle of printed papers announcing the terms on which m chalabre the de was dropped now and for evermore was desirous of teaching french and a little paragraph at the bottom of the page solicited the patronage of schools now this was a great coming down in former days non-teaching at schools had been the line which marked that m de chalabre had taken up teaching rather as an amateur profession than with any intention of devoting his life to it 
he respectfully asked me to distribute these papers where I thought fit. I say respectfully, advisedly. There was none of the old deferential gallantry as offered by a gentleman to a lady, his equal in birth and fortune. Instead, there was the matter-of-fact request and statement which a workman offers to his employer. Only in my father's room he was the former Monsieur de Chalabre. He seemed to understand how vain would be all attempts to recount or explain the circumstances which had led him so decidedly to take a lower level in society. To my father, to the day of his death, Monsieur de Chalabre maintained the old easy footing, assumed a gaiety which he never even pretended to feel anywhere else, listened to my father's childish interests with a true and kindly sympathy for which I ever felt grateful, although he purposely put a deferential reserve between him and me as a barrier to any expression of such feeling on my part. His former lessons had been held in such high esteem by those who were privileged to receive them, that he was soon sought after on all sides. The schools of the two principal county towns put forward their claims, and considered it a favour to receive his instructions. Morning, noon and night he was engaged, even if he had not proudly withdrawn himself from all merely society engagements, he would have had no leisure for them. His only visits were paid to my father, who looked for them with a kind of childish longing. One day, to my surprise, he asked to be allowed to speak to me for an instant alone. He stood silent for a moment, turning his hat in his hand. You have a right to know. You, my first pupil. Next Tuesday, I marry myself to Miss Susan Dobson, good, respectable woman, to whose happiness I mean to devote my life, or as much of it as is not occupied with the duties of instruction. He looked up at me, expecting congratulations, perhaps, but I was too much stunned with my surprise. The buxom, red-armed, apple-cheeked Susan, who, when she blushed, blushed the colour of beetroot, who did not know a word of French, who regarded the nation, always excepting the gentlemen before me, as frog-eating mounseers, the national enemies of England. I afterwards thought that perhaps this very ignorance constituted one of her charms. No word, nor allusion, nor expressive silence, nor regretful sympathetic sighs could remind Monsieur de Chalabre of the bitter past, which he was evidently striving to forget. And, most assuredly, Never man had a more devoted and admiring wife than poor Susan made Monsieur de Chalabre. She was a little awed by him, to be sure, never quite at her ease before him, but I imagine husbands do not dislike such a tribute to their Jupitership. Madame Chalabre received my call, after their marriage, with a degree of sober, rustic, happy dignity, which I could not have foreseen in Susan Dobson, they had taken a small cottage on the borders of the forest. It had a garden round it, and the cow, pigs and poultry, which were to be her charge, found their keep in the forest. She had a rough country servant to assist her in looking after them, and in what scanty leisure he had, her husband attended to the garden and the bees. Madame Chalabre took me over the neatly furnished cottage with evident pride. Musaya, as she called him, had done this. Musaya had fitted up that. Musaya was evidently a man of resource. In a little closet of the dressing-room belonging to Musaya, there hung a pencil drawing, elaborately finished to the condition of a bad pocket-book engraving. It caught my eye and I lingered to look at it. It represented a high, narrow house of considerable size, with four pepper-box turrets at each corner, and a stiff avenue formed the foreground. Chateau Chalabre, said I, inquisitively. I never asked, my companion replied. Messiah does not always like to be asked questions. It is the picture of some place he's very fond of, for he won't let me dust it for fear I should smear it. Monsieur de Chalabre's marriage did not diminish the number of his visits to my father until that beloved parent's death. 
he was faithful in doing all he could to lighten the gloom of the sick room but a chasm which he had opened separated any present intercourse with him from the free unreserved friendship that had existed formerly and yet for his sake i used to go and see his wife i could not forget early days nor the walks to the top of the clover field nor the daily poses nor my mother's dear regard for the emigrant gentleman nor a thousand little kindnesses which he had shown to my absent sister and myself he did not forget either in the closed and sealed chambers of his heart so for his sake i tried to become a friend to his wife and she learned to look upon me as such it was my employment in the sick chamber to make clothes for the little expected shalabra baby and its mother would fain as she told me have asked me to carry the little infant to the font but that her husband somewhat austerely reminded her that they ought to seek a marraine among those of their own station in society but i regarded the pretty little susan as my godchild nevertheless in my heart and secretly pledged myself always to take an interest in her not two months after my father's death a sister was born and the human heart in Monsieur de Chalabre subdued his pride. The child was to bear the pretty name of his French mother, although France could find no place for him, and had cast him out. That youngest little girl was called M.A. When my father died, Fanny and her husband urged me to leave Brookfield and come and live with them at Valletta. The estate was left to us, but an eligible tenant offered himself, and my health, which had suffered materially during my long nursing, did render it desirable for me to seek some change to a warmer climate. So I went abroad, ostensibly for a year's residence only, but somehow that year has grown into a lifetime. Malta and Genoa have been my dwelling places ever since. Occasionally, it is true, I have paid visits to England, but I have never looked upon it as my home since I left it thirty years ago. During these visits I have seen the Chalabre. He had become more absorbed in his occupation than ever, had published a French grammar on some new principle, of which he presented me with a copy, taking some pains to explain how it was to be used. Madame looked plump and prosperous. The farm which was under her management had thriven, and as for the two daughters, behind their english shyness they had a good deal of french piquancy and esprit i induced them to take some walks with me with a view of asking them some questions which should make our friendship an individual reality not merely an hereditary feeling but the little monkeys put me through my catechism and asked me innumerable questions about france which they evidently regarded as their country how do you know all about French habits and customs? asked I. Does Monsieur de... does your father talk to you much about France? Sometimes, when we are alone with him, never when anyone is by, answered Susan, the elder, a grave, noble-looking girl of twenty or thereabouts. I think he does not speak about France before my mother, for fear of hurting her. And I think, said little M.A., that he does not speak at all when he can help it. It is only when his heart gets too full with recollections that he is obliged to talk to us, because many of the thoughts could not be said in English. Then I suppose you are two famous French scholars. Oh, yes, Papa always speaks to us in French. It is our own language. But with all their devotion to their father and to his country, they were the most affectionate, dutiful daughters to their mother. They were her companions, her comforts in the pleasant household labours, most practical, useful young women, but in a privacy not the less sacred, because it was understood rather than prescribed. They kept all the enthusiasm, all the romance of their nature for their father. They were the confidants of that poor exile's yearnings for France, the eager listeners for what he chose to tell them of his early days. His words wrought up Susan to make the resolution that if ever she felt herself free from home duties and responsibilities, she would become a sister of charity like Anne-Marguerite de Chalabre, 
her father's great aunt and model of woman's sanctity. As for Emma, come what might, she never would leave her father, and that was all she was clear about in picturing her future. Three years ago I was in Paris, an English friend of mine who lives there, English by birth but married to a German professor and very French in manners and ways, asked me to come to her house one evening. I was far from well and disinclined to stir out. Oh, but come, said she, I have a good reason, really a tempting reason. Perhaps this very evening a piece of poetical justice will be done in my salon. A living romance. Now, can you resist? What is it? said I for she was rather in the habit of exaggerating trifles into romances. A young lady is coming, not in the first youth, but still young, very pretty, daughter of a French émigré whom my husband knew in Belgium, and who has lived in England ever since. I beg your pardon, but what is her name? interrupted I, roused to interest. De Chalabre, do you know her? Yes, I am much interested in her. I will gladly come to meet her. How long has she been in Paris? Is it Susan or Emma? Now, I am not to be balked of the pleasure of telling you my romance, my hoped-for bit of poetical justice. You must be patient, and you will have answers to all your questions. I sank back in my easy chair. Some of my friends are rather long-winded, and it is as well to be settled in a comfortable position before they begin to talk. I told you a minute ago, that my husband had become acquainted with Monsieur de Chalabre in Belgium in 1815. They have kept up a correspondence ever since. Not a very brisk one, it is true, for Monsieur de Chalabre was a French master in England and my husband a professor in Paris. But still they managed to let each other know how they were going on and what they were doing, once if not twice every year. For myself, I never saw Monsieur de Chalabre. I know him well, said I. I have known him all my life. A year ago his wife died. She was an English woman. She had had a long and suffering illness, and his eldest daughter had devoted herself to her with the patient sweetness of an angel, as he told us, and I can well believe. But after her mother's death, the world, it seems, became distasteful to her. She had been inured to the half-lights, the hushed voices, the constant thoughts for others required in a sick-room and the noise and rough bustle of healthy people jarred upon her. So she pleaded with her father to allow her to become a sister of charity. She told him that he would have given a welcome to any suitor who came to offer to marry her, and bear her away from her home and her father and sister. And now, when she was called by religion, would he grudge to part with her? He gave his consent, if not his full approbation, and he wrote to my husband to beg me to receive her here, while we sought out a convent into which she could be received. She has been with me two months, and endeared herself to me unspeakably. She goes home next week, unless... But I beg your pardon, did you not say she wished to become a sister of charity? It is true, but she was too old to be admitted into their order. She is eight and twenty. It has been a grievous disappointment to her. She has borne it very patiently and meekly but I can see how deeply she has felt it. And now for my romance. My husband had a pupil some ten years ago, a Monsieur Dufay, a clever, scientific young man, one of the first merchants of Rouen. His grandfather purchased Monsieur de Chalabre's ancestral estate. The present Monsieur Dufay came on business to Paris two or three days ago and invited my husband to a little dinner and somehow this story of Suzette Chalabre came out in consequence of inquiries my husband was making for an escort to take her to England. Monsieur Dufay seemed interested with the story, and asked my husband if he might pay his respects to me some evening when Suzette should be in. And so he's coming tonight. He and a friend of his, who was at the dinner party the other day, will you come? I went more in the hope of seeing Susan Chalabre and hearing some news about my early home than with any expectation of poetical justice. And in that I was right, and yet I was wrong. Susan Chalabre was a grave, gentlewoman of an enthusiastic and devoted appearance, 
not unlike that portrait of his daughter which arrests every eye in Addy Sheffer's sacred pictures. She was silent and sad. Her cherished plan of life was uprooted. She talked to me a little in a soft and friendly manner, answering any questions I asked. But as for the gentlemen, her indifference and reserve made it impossible for them to enter into any conversation with her, and the meeting was indisputably flat. Oh, my romance! My poetical justice! Before the evening was half over, I would have given up all my castles in the air for one well-sustained conversation of ten minutes long. Now don't laugh at me, for I can't bear it tonight. Such was my friend's parting speech. I did not see her again for two days. The third she came in, glowing with excitement. You may congratulate me after all. If it was not poetical justice, it is prosaic justice. And, except for the empty romance, that is a better thing. What do you mean, said I? Surely Monsieur de Fay has not proposed for Susan. No, but that charming Monsieur de Fay's, his friend, has. That is to say, not proposed, but spoken. No, not spoken, but it seems he asked Monsieur de Fay, whose confidant he was, if he was intending to proceed in his idea of marrying Suzette, and on hearing that he was not, Monsieur de Fres said that he should come to us and ask us to put him in the way of prosecuting the acquaintance, for that he had been charmed with her, looks, voice, silence, he admires them all, and we have arranged that he is to be the escort to England. He has business there, he says, and as for Suzette, she knows nothing of all this, of course, for who dared tell her? All her anxiety is to return home, and the first person travelling to England will satisfy her if it does us. And after all, Monsieur de Fres lives within five leagues of the Chateau Chalabre, so she can go and see the old place whenever she will. When I went to bid Susan good-bye, she looked as unconscious and dignified as ever. No idea of a lover had ever crossed her mind. She considered Monsieur de Fres as a kind of necessary encumbrance for the journey. I had not much hopes for him, and yet he was an agreeable man enough, and my friends told me that his character stood firm and high. In three months I was settled for the winter in Rome. In four I heard that the marriage of Susan Chalabre had taken place. What were the intermediate steps between the cold, civil indifference with which I had last seen her, regarding her travelling companion, and the full love which such a woman as Suzette Chalabre must love a man, before she could call him husband, I never learnt. I wrote to my old French master to congratulate him, as I believed I honestly might, on his daughter's marriage. It was some months before I received his answer. It was, Dear friend, dear old pupil, dear child of the beloved dead, I am an old man of eighty, and I tremble towards the grave. I cannot write many words, but my own hand shall bid you come to the home of Emme and her husband. They tell me to ask you to come and see the old father's birthplace while he is yet alive to show it to you. I have the very apartment in Chateau Chalabre that was mine when I was a boy, and my mother came in to bless me every night. Suzanne lives near us. The good God bless my sons-in-law, Bertrand de Fraise and Alphonse du Fay, as he has blessed me all my life long. I think of your father and mother, my dear, and you must think no harm when I tell you I have had a masses said for the repose of their souls. If I make a mistake, God will forgive. My heart could have interpreted this letter, even without the pretty letter of M.A., and her husband, which accompanied it, and which told how, when Monsieur Dufay came over to his friend's wedding, he had seen the younger sister, and in her seen his fate. The soft, caressing, timid Emme was more to his taste than the grave and stately Susan. Yet little Emme managed to rule imperiously at Chateau Chalabre, or rather, her husband was delighted to indulge her every wish while Susan, in her grand way, 
made rather a pomp of her conjugal obedience. But they were both good wives, good daughters. This last summer you may have seen an old, old man, dressed in grey, with white flowers in his buttonhole, gathered by a grandchild as fair as they, leading an elderly lady about the grounds of Chateau Chalabre, with tottering, unsteady eagerness of gait. Here, said he to me, just here, my mother bade me adieu when first I went to join my regiment. I was impatient to go. I mounted. I rode to yonder great chestnut, and then, looking back, I saw my mother's sorrowful countenance. I sprang off, threw the reins to the groom, and ran back for one more embrace. My brave boy, she said, my own, be faithful to God and your king. I never saw her more, but I shall see her soon, and I think I may tell her I have been faithful both to my God and my king. Before now, he has told his mother all. End of My French Master by Elizabeth Gaskell The Squire's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, number 196, Winter 1853. In the year 1769, the little town of Barford was thrown into a state of great excitement by the intelligence that a gentleman, and quite the gentleman, said the landlord of the George Inn, had been looking at Mr. Clavering's old house. This house was neither in the town nor in the country. It stood on the outskirts of Barford, on the roadside leading to Derby. The last occupant had been a Mr. Clavering, a Northumberland gentleman of good family, who had come to live in Barford when he was but a younger son. But when some elder branches of the family died, he had returned to take possession of the family estate. The house of which I speak was called the White House, from it being covered with a greyish kind of stucco. It had a good garden to the back, and Mr. Clavering had built capital stables, with what were then considered the latest improvements. The point of good stabling was expected to let the house, as it was in a hunting county, otherwise it had few recommendations. There were many bedrooms, some entered through others, even to the number of five, leading one beyond the other. Several sitting-rooms of the small and pokey kind, wainscoted round with wood, and then painted a heavy slate colour. One good dining-room and a drawing-room over it, both looking into the garden with pleasant bow-windows. Such was the accommodation offered by the White House. It did not seem to be very tempting to strangers, though the good people of Barford rather piqued themselves on it as the largest house in the town, and as a house in which townspeople and county people had often met at Mr. Clavering's friendly dinners. To appreciate this circumstance of pleasant recollection, you should have lived some years in a little country town, surrounded by gentlemen's seats. You would then understand how a bow or a curtsy from a member of a county family elevates the individuals who receive it, almost as much in their own eyes, as the pair of blue garters fringed with silver did Mr. Bickerstaff's ward. They trip lightly on air for a whole day afterwards. Now Mr. Clavering was gone, where could town and county mingle? I mention these things, that you may have an idea of the desirability of the letting of the White House in the Barfordite's imagination and to make the mixture thick and slab, you must add for yourselves the bustle, the mystery, and the importance which every little event either causes or assumes in a small town. Then, perhaps, it will be no wonder to you that twenty ragged little urchins accompanied the gentleman aforesaid to the door of the White House, and that, 
although he was above an hour inspecting it under the auspices of mr jones the agent's clerk thirty more had joined themselves on to the wondering crowd before his exit and awaited such crumbs of intelligence as they could gather before they were threatened or whipped out of hearing distance presently out came the gentleman and the lawyer's clerk the latter was speaking as he followed the former over the threshold the gentleman was tall well dressed handsome but there was a sinister cold look in his quick glancing light blue eye which a keen observer might not have liked there were no keen observers among the boys and ill-conditioned gaping girls but they stood too near inconveniently close and the gentleman lifting up his right hand in which he carried a short riding whip dealt one or two sharp blows to the nearest with a look of savage enjoyment on his face as they moved away whimpering and crying an instant after his expression of countenance had changed here said he drawing out a handful of money partly silver partly copper and throwing it into the midst of them scramble for it fight it out my lads come this afternoon at three to the george and i'll throw you out some more so the boys hurrahed for him as he walked off with the agent's clerk he chuckled to himself as over a pleasant thought i'll have some fun with those lads he said i'll teach em to come prowling and prying about me i'll tell you what i'll do i'll make the money so hot in the fire shovel that it shall burn their fingers you come and see the faces and the howling i shall be very glad if you will dine with me at two i may have made up my mind about the house mr jones the agent's clerk agreed to come to the george at two but somehow he had a distaste for his entertainer mr jones would not like to have said even to himself that a man with a purse full of money who kept many horses and spoke familiarly of noblemen above all who thought of taking the white house could be anything but a gentleman but still the uneasy wonder as to who this mr robinson higgins could be filled the clerk's mind long after mr higgins mr higgins's servants and mr higgins's stud had taken possession of the white house the white house was re-stuccoed this time of a pale yellow colour and put into thorough repair by the accommodating and delighted landlord while his tenant seemed inclined to spend any amount of money on internal decorations which were showy and effective in their character enough to make the white house a nine days wonder to the good people of barford the slate coloured paints became pink and were picked out gold the old-fashioned banisters were replaced by newly gilt ones but above all the stables were a sight to be seen since the days of the roman emperor never was there such provision made for the care the comfort and the health of horses but every one said it was no wonder when they were led through barford covered up to their eyes but curving their arched and delicate necks and prancing with short high steps in repressed eagerness only one groom came with them yet they required the care of three men mr higgins however preferred engaging two lads out of barford and barford highly approved of his preference not only was it kind and thoughtful to give employment to the lounging lads themselves but they were receiving such a training in mr higgins stables as might fit them for doncaster or newmarket the district of derbyshire in which barford was situated was too close to leicestershire not to support a hunt and a pack of hounds the master of the hounds was a certain harry manley who was aught a huntsman aught nullus he measured a man by the length of his fork not by the expression of his countenance or the shape of his head but as sir harry was wont to observe there was such a thing as too long a fork so his approbation was withheld until he had seen a man on horseback and if his seat there was square and easy his hand light and his courage good sir harry hailed him as a brother mr higgins attended the first meet of the season not as a subscriber but as an amateur the barford huntsmen piqued themselves on their bold riding and their knowledge of the country came by nature yet this new strange man whom nobody knew was in at the death 
sitting on his horse, both well breathed and calm. Without a hair turned on the sleek skin of the latter, supremely addressing the old huntsman as he hacked off the tail of the fox. And he, the old man, who was testy even under Sir Harry's slightest rebuke, and flew out on any member of the hunt that dared to utter a word against his sixty years' experience as stable boy, groom, poacher, and what not. He, old Isaac Wormley, was meekly listening to the wisdom of this stranger, only now and then giving one of his quick, upturning, cunning glances, not unlike the sharp or canny looks of the poor deceased Reynard, round whom the hounds were howling, unadmonished by the short whip, which was now tucked into Wormley's well-worn pocket. When Sir Harry rode into the copse, full of dead brushwood and wet tangled grass, and was followed by the members of the hunt, as one by one they cantered past, Mr. Higgins took off his cap and bowed, half deferentially, half insolently, with a lurking smile in the corner of his eye, at the discomfited looks at one or two of the laggards. "'A famous run, sir,' said Sir Harry. "'The first time you have hunted in our country, but I hope we shall see you often.' "'I hope to become a member of the hunt, sir,' said Mr. Higgins. "'Most happy, proud, I'm sure, to receive so daring a rider among us. "'You took the cropper gate, I fancy, while one or two of our friends here,' "'scowling at one or two cowards by way of finishing his speech. "'Allow me to introduce myself, Master of the Hounds.' "'He fumbled in his waistcoat pocket for the card on which his name was formerly inscribed. "'Some of our friends here are kind enough to come home with me to dinner. "'Might I ask for the honour? "'My name is Higgins,' replied the stranger, bowing low. "'I am only lately come to occupy the White House at Barford, "'and I have not as yet presented my letters of introduction.' "'Hang it!' replied Sir Harry. "'A man with a seat like yours, and that good brush in your hand, "'might ride up to any door in the county. "'I'm a Leicestershire man, and be a welcome guest. "'Mr Higgins, I shall be proud to become better acquainted with you over my dinner-table.' Mr. Higgins knew pretty well how to improve the acquaintance thus begun. He could sing a good song, tell a good story, and was well up in practical jokes, with plenty of that keen worldly sense which seems like an instinct in some men, and which, in this case, taught him on whom he might play off such jokes with impunity from their resentment, and with a security of applause from the more boisterous, vehement, or prosperous. At the end of twelve months, Mr. Robinson Higgins was out and out, the most popular member of the Barford Hunt, had beaten all the others by a couple of lengths, as his first patron, Sir Harry, observed one evening, when they were just leaving the dinner-table of an old hunting squire in the neighbourhood. "'Because you know,' said Squire Hearn, holding Sir Harry by the button, "'I mean, you see, this young spark is looking sweet upon Catherine, "'and she's a good girl, and will have ten thousand pounds down the day she's married, "'by her mother's will. "'And, excuse me, Sir Harry, but I should not like my girl to throw herself away.' "'Though Sir Harry had a long ride before him, "'and but the early and short light of a new moon to take it in, his kind heart was so much touched by Squire Hearn's trembling, tearful anxiety that he stopped and turned back into the dining-room to say, with more asseverations than I care to give, My good squire, I may say I know that man pretty well by this time, and a better fellow never existed. If I had twenty daughters, he should have the pick of them. Squire Hearn never thought of asking the grounds for his old friend's opinion of Mr. Higgins. It had been given with too much earnestness for any doubts to cross the old man's mind as to the possibility of its being not well founded. Mr. Hearn was not a doubter or a thinker, or suspicious by nature. It was simply his love for Catherine, his only child, that prompted his anxiety in this case. And after what Sir Harry had said, the old man could totter with an easy mind, though not with very steady legs, into the drawing-room, where his bonny blushing daughter, Catherine, and Mr. Higgins stood close together on the hearth-rug, he whispering, she listening with downcast eyes. She looked so happy, so like her dead mother had looked when the squire was a young man, 
that all his thought was how to please her most. His son and heir was about to be married, and bring his wife to live with the squire. Barford and the White House were not distant an hour's ride. And even as these thoughts passed through his mind, he asked Mr. Higgins if he could not stay all night. The young moon was already set, the roads would be dark. And Catherine looked up with a pretty anxiety, which, however, had not much doubt in it for the answer. With every encouragement of this kind from the old squire, it took everybody rather by surprise, when one morning it was discovered that Miss Catherine Hearn was missing. And when, according to the usual fashion in such cases, a note was found saying that she had eloped with the man of her heart and gone to Gretna Green, no one could imagine why she could not quietly have stopped at home and been married in the parish church. She had always been a romantic, sentimental girl, very pretty and very affectionate, and very much spoiled, and very much wanting in common sense. Her indulgent father was deeply hurt at this want of confidence in his never-varying affection. But when his son came, hot with indignation from the baronets, his future father-in-law's house, where every form of law and ceremony was to accompany his own impending marriage. Squire Hearn pleaded the cause of the young couple with imploring cogency, and protested that it was a piece of spirit in his daughter, which he admired and was proud of. However, it ended with Mr. Nathaniel Hearn's declaring that he and his wife would have nothing to do with his sister and her husband. "'Wait till you've seen him, not said the old squire, trembling with his distressful anticipations of family discord. "'He's an excuse for any girl. Only ask Sir Harry's opinion of him. Confound Sir Harry, so that a man sits his horse well. Sir Harry cares nothing about anything else. Who is this man, this fellow? Where does he come from? What are his means? Who are his family?' "'He comes from the South, Surrey or Somersetshire, I forget which.' and he pays his way very well and liberally. There's not a tradesman in Barford but says he cares no more for money than for water. He spends like a prince, Nat. I don't know who his family are, but he seals with a coat of arms which may tell you if you want to know, and he goes regularly to collect his rents from his estates in the south. Oh, Nat, if you would but be friendly, I should be as well pleased with Kitty's marriage as any father in the country." Mr. Nathaniel Hearn gloomed and muttered an oath or two to himself. The poor old father was reaping the consequences of his weak indulgence to his two children. Mr. and Mrs. Nathaniel Hearn kept apart from Catherine and her husband, and Squire Hearn durst never ask them to Levinson Hall, though it was his own house. Indeed, he stole away as if he were a culprit whenever he went to visit the White House, and if he passed a night there, he was fain to equivocate when he returned home the next day, an equivocation which was well interpreted by the surly, proud Nathaniel. But the younger Mr. and Mrs. Hearn were the only people who did not visit at the White House. Mr. and Mrs. Higgins were decidedly more popular than their brother and sister-in-law. She made a very pretty, sweet-tempered hostess, and her education had not been such as to make her intolerant of any want of refinement in the associates who gathered round her husband. She had gentle smiles for townspeople, as well as country people, and unconsciously played an admirable second in her husband's project of making himself universally popular. But there is someone to make ill-natured remarks, and draw ill-natured conclusions, from very simple premises, in every place. And in Barford, this bird of ill omen was a Miss Pratt. She did not hunt, so Mr. Higgins' admirable riding did not call out her admiration. She did not drink, so the well-selected wines, so lavishly dispensed among his guests, could never mollify Miss Pratt. She could not bear comic songs or buffo stories, so in that way, her approbation was impregnable, and these three secrets of popularity constituted Mr. Higgins's great charm. Miss Pratt sat and watched, 
her face looked immovably grave at the end of any of mr higgins's best stories but there was a keen needle-like glance of her unwinking little eyes which mr higgins felt rather than saw and which made him shiver even on a hot day when it fell upon him miss pratt was a dissenter and to propitiate this female mordecai mr higgins asked the dissenting minister whose services she attended to dinner kept himself and his company in good order gave a handsome donation to the poor of the chapel all in vain miss pratt stirred not a muscle more of her face towards graciousness and mr higgins was conscious that in spite of all his open efforts to captivate mr davis there was a secret influence on the other side throwing in doubts and suspicions and evil interpretations of all he said or did miss pratt the little plain old maid living on eighty pounds a year was the thorn in the popular mr higgins's side although she had never spoken one uncivil word to him indeed on the contrary had treated him with a stiff and elaborate civility the thorn the grief to mrs higgins was this they had no children oh how she would stand and envy the careless busy motion of half a dozen children and then when observed move on with a deep deep sigh of yearning regret but it was as well it was noticed that mr higgins was remarkably careful of his health he ate drank took exercise rested by some secret rules of his own occasionally bursting into an excess it is true but only on rare occasions such as when he returned from visiting his estates in the south and collecting his rents that unusual exertion and fatigue for there were no stage coaches within forty miles of barford and he like most country gentlemen of that day would have preferred riding if there had been seemed to require some strange excess to compensate for it and rumours went up through the town that he shut himself up and drank enormously for some days after his return but no one was admitted to these orgies one day they remembered it well afterwards the hounds met not far from the town and the fox was found in a part of the wild heath which was beginning to be enclosed by a few of the more wealthy townspeople who were desirous of building themselves houses rather more in the country than those they had hitherto lived in among these the principal was a mr dudgeon the attorney of barford and the agent for all the county families about the firm of dudgeon had managed the leases the marriage settlements and the wills of the neighbourhood for generations mr dudgeon's father had the responsibility of collecting the landowner's rents just as the present mr dudgeon had at the time of which i speak and as his son and his son's son have done since their business was an hereditary estate to them and with something of the old feudal feeling was mixed a kind of proud humility at their position towards the squires whose family secrets they had mastered and the mysteries of whose fortunes and estates were better known to the messrs dudgeon than to themselves mr john dudgeon had built himself a house on wildbury heath a mere cottage as he called it but though only two stories high it spread out far and wide and workpeople from derby had been sent for on purpose to make the inside as complete as possible the gardens too were exquisite in arrangement if not very expensive and not a flower was grown in them but of the rarest species it must have been somewhat of a mortification to the owner of this dainty place when on the day of which i speak the fox after a long race during which he had described a circle of many miles took refuge in the garden but mr dudgeon put a good face on the matter when a gentleman hunter with the careless insolence of the squires of those days and that place rode across the velvet lawn and tapping at the window of the dining-room with his whip-handle asked permission no that is not it rather informed mr dudgeon of their intention to enter his garden in a body and have the fox unearthed mr dudgeon compelled himself to smile assent with the grace of a masculine griselda 
and then he hastily gave orders to have all that the house afforded of provision set out for luncheon, guessing rightly enough that six hours' run would give even homely fare an acceptable welcome. He bore without wincing the entrance of the dirty boots into his exquisitely clean rooms. He only felt grateful for the care with which Mr. Higgins strode about, laboriously and noiselessly moving on the tips of his toes as he reconnoitred the rooms with a curious eye. "'I'm going to build a house myself, Dudgeon, and upon my word I don't think I could take a better model than yours.' "'Oh, my poor cottage would be too small to afford any hints for such a house as you would wish to build, Mr. Higgins,' replied Mr. Dudgeon, gently rubbing his hands nevertheless at the compliments. "'Not at all, not at all. Let me see. You have dining-room, drawing-room.' He hesitated, and Mr. Dudgeon filled up the blank as he expected. Four sitting-rooms and the bedrooms, but allow me to show you over the house. I confess I took some pains in arranging it, and though far smaller than what you would require, it may nevertheless afford you some hints. So they left the eating gentlemen with their mouths and their plates quite full, and the scent of the fox overpowering that of the hasty rashes of ham, and they carefully inspected all the ground-floor rooms. Then Mr. Dudgeon said, if you are not tired, Mr. Higgins, it is rather my hobby, so you must pull me up if you are. We will go upstairs and I will show you my sanctum. Mr. Dudgeon's sanctum was the centre room over the porch, which formed a balcony and which was carefully filled with choice flowers in pots. Inside there were all kinds of elegant contrivances for hiding the real strength of all the boxes and chests required by the particular nature of Mr. Dudgeon's business, for although his office was in Barford, he kept, as he informed Mr. Higgins, what was most valuable here, as being safer than an office which was locked up and left every night. But as Mr. Higgins reminded him, with a sly poke in the side, when they next met, his own house was not over-secure, a fortnight after the gentlemen of the Barford Hunt lunched there, Mr. Dudgeon's strong-box in his sanctum upstairs, with the mysterious spring-bolt to the window invented by himself, and the secret of which was only known to the inventor and a few of his most intimate friends to whom he had proudly shown it. This strong-box containing the collected Christmas rents of half a dozen landlords, there was then no bank nearer than Derby, was rifled, and the secretly rich Mr. Dudgeon had to stop his agent in his purchases of paintings by Flemish artists, because the money was required to make good the missing rents. The Dogberries and vergers of those days were quite incapable of obtaining any clue to the robber or robbers, and though one or two vagrants were taken up and brought before Mr. Dunover and Mr. Higgins, the magistrates who usually attended in the courtroom at Barford, there was no evidence brought against them, and after a couple of nights' durance in the lock-ups, they were set at liberty. But it became a standing joke with Mr. Higgins to Mr. Dudgeon, from time to time, whether he could recommend him a place of safety for his valuables, or if he had made any more inventions lately for securing houses from robbers. About seven years after Mr. Higgins had been married, one Tuesday evening Mr. Davis was sitting reading the news in the coffee-room of the George Inn. He belonged to a club of gentlemen who met there occasionally to play at whist, to read what few newspapers and magazines were published in those days, to chat about the market at Derby and prices all over the country. This Tuesday night it was a black frost, and few people were in the room, Mr. Davis was anxious to finish an article in the gentleman's magazine. Indeed, he was making extracts from it, intending to answer it, and yet unable with his small income to purchase a copy. So he stayed late. It was past nine, and at ten o'clock the room was closed. But while he wrote, Mr. Higgins came in. He was pale and haggard with cold. Mr. Davis who had had for some time sole possession of the fire, moved politely on one side and handed to the newcomer the sole London newspaper which the room afforded. 
Mr. Higgins accepted it, and made some remark on the intense coldness of the weather, but Mr. Davis was too full of his article, and intended reply, to fall into conversation readily. Mr. Higgins hitched his chair nearer to the fire, and put his feet on the fender, giving an audible shudder, he put the newspaper on one end of the table near him, and sat gazing into the red embers of the fire, crouching down over them, as if his very marrow were chilled. At length he said, There is no account of the murder at Bath in that paper. Mr. Davis, who had finished taking his notes, and was preparing to go, stopped short and asked, Has there been a murder at Bath? No, I have not seen anything of it. Who was murdered? "'Oh, it was a shocking, terrible murder,' said Mr. Higgins, "'not raising his look from the fire, but gazing on, "'his eyes dilated till the whites were seen all around them. "'A terrible murder! "'I wonder what will become of the murderer. "'I can fancy the red glowing centre of that fire. "'Look and see how infinitely distant it seems, "'and how the distance magnifies it into something awful and unquenchable. "'My dear sir, you are feverish.' "'How you shake and shiver,' said Mr. Davis, "'thinking privately that his companion had symptoms of fever, "'and that he was wandering in his mind. "'Oh, no,' said Mr. Higgins, "'I am not feverish. "'It is the night which is so cold.' "'And for a time he talked with Mr. Davis "'about the article in the gentleman's magazine, "'for he was rather a reader himself, "'and could take more interest in Mr. Davis's pursuits "'than most of the people at Barford. At length it drew near to ten, and Mr. Davis rose up to go home to his lodgings. "'No, Davis, don't go. I want you here. We will have a bottle of port together, and that will put Saunders in good humour. I want to tell you about this murder,' he continued, dropping his voice and speaking hoarse and low. "'She was an old woman, and he killed her, sitting reading her Bible by her own fireside.' He looked at Mr. Davis with a strange, searching gaze, as if trying to find some sympathy in the horror which the idea presented to him. "'Who do you mean, my dear sir? What is this murder you're so full of? No one has been murdered here.' "'No, you fool! I tell you it was in Bath,' said Mr. Higgins, with sudden passion, and then, calming himself to most velvet smoothness of manner, he laid his hand on Mr. Davis's knee. There, as they sat by the fire, and gently detaining him, began the narration of the crime he was so full of. But his voice and manner were constrained to a stony quietude. He never looked in Mr. Davis's face. Once or twice, as Mr. Davis remembered afterwards, his grip tightened like a compressing vice. She lived in a small house, in a quiet old-fashioned street, she and her maid, People said she was a good old woman, but for all that she hoarded and hoarded and never gave to the poor. Mr. Davis, it is wicked not to give to the poor. Wicked, is it not? I always give to the poor, for once I read in the Bible that charity covereth a multitude of sins. The wicked old woman never gave, but hoarded her money and saved and saved. Someone heard of it. I say she threw a temptation in his way, and God will punish her for it. And this man, or it might be a woman, who knows, and this person heard also that she went to church in the mornings and her maid in the afternoons. And so, while the maid was at church and the street and the house quite still and the darkness of a winter afternoon coming on, she was nodding over the Bible. And that, mark you, is a sin and one that God will avenge sooner or later. And a step came in the dusk up to the stair and that person I told you of stood in the room. At first he... No, at first it is supposed, for you understand, all this is mere guesswork. It, it is supposed that he asked her civilly enough to give him her money, or tell him where it was. But the old miser defied him, and would not ask for mercy and give up her keys, even when he threatened her, but looked him in the face as if he had been a baby. Oh, God, Mr. Davis, I once dreamt, when I was a little innocent boy, that I should commit a crime like this, and I wakened up crying, and my mother comforted me. That is the reason I tremble so now, that and the cold, for it is very, very cold. 
"'But did he murder the old lady?' asked Mr. Davis. "'I beg your pardon, sir, but I am interested by your story. "'Yes, he cut her throat, and there she lies yet, "'in her quiet little parlour, with her face upturned "'and all ghastly white, in the middle of a pool of blood. "'Mr. Davis, this wine is no better than water. "'I must have some brandy.' Mr. Davis was horror-struck by the story, which seemed to have fascinated him as much as it had done his companion. "'Have they got any clue to the murderer?' said he. Mr. Higgins drank down half a tumbler of, of raw brandy before he answered. "'No, no clue whatever. They will never be able to discover him, and I should not wonder, Mr. Davis, I should not wonder if he repented after all, and did bitter penance for his crime. And if so, Will there be mercy for him at, at the last day? God knows, said Mr. Davis with solemnity. It is an awful story, continued he, rousing himself. I hardly like to leave this warm light room and go out into the darkness after hearing it. But it must be done, buttoning on his greatcoat. I can only say, I hope and trust they will find out the murderer and hang him. If you'll take my advice, you'll have bed warmed, and drink a treacle posset just the last thing and if you'll allow me i'll send you my answer to philologus before it goes up to old urban the next morning mr davis went to call on a miss pratt who was not very well and by way of being agreeable and entertaining he related to her all he had heard the night before about the murder in bath and really he made a very pretty connected story out of it and interested Miss Pratt very much in the fate of the old lady, partly because of a similarity in their situations, for she also hoarded money, and had but one servant, and stopped at home alone on Sunday afternoons to allow her servant to go to church. "'And when did all this happen?' she asked. "'I don't know if Mr. Higgins named the day, and yet I think it must have been this very last Sunday. "'And today is Wednesday. Ill news travels fast.' "'Yes, Mr. Higgins thought it might have been in the London newspaper. "'That it could never be. "'Where did Mr. Higgins learn all about it? "'I don't know. I did not ask. "'I think he only came home yesterday. "'He had been south to collect his rents, somebody said.' "'Miss Pratt grunted. "'She used to vent her dislike and suspicions of Mr. Higgins "'in a grunt whenever his name was mentioned. "'Well, I shan't see you for some days.' Godfrey Merton has asked me to go and stay with him and his sister, and I think it will do me good. Besides, added she, these winter evenings, and these murderers at large in the country, I don't quite like living with only Peggy to call to in case of need. Miss Pratt went to stay with her cousin, Mr. Merton. He was an active magistrate, and enjoyed his reputation as such. One day he came in, having just received his letters. "'Bad account of the morals of your little town here, Jessie,' said he, touching one of his letters. "'You've either a murderer among you, or some friend of a murderer. Here's a poor old lady at Bath, had her throat cut last Sunday week, and I've a letter from the Home Office asking to lend them my very efficient aid, as they're pleased to call it, towards finding out the culprit.' It seems he must have been thirsty and of a comfortable jolly turn, for before going to his horrid work, he tapped a barrel of ginger wine the old lady had set by to work, and he wrapped the spigot round with a piece of a letter taken out of his pocket, as may be supposed. And this piece of a letter was found afterwards. There are only these letters on the outside. N.S., Esquire, Arford, Egworth, which someone has ingeniously made out to mean Barford near Kegworth. On the other side, there is some allusion to a racehorse, I conjecture, though the name is singular enough. Church and King and Down with the Rump. Miss Pratt caught at this name immediately. It had hurt her feeling as a dissenter only a few months ago, and she remembered it well. Mr. Nat Hearn has, or had, as I am speaking in the witness-box, as it were, I must take care of my tenses. A horse with that ridiculous name. Mr. Nat Hearn, repeated Mr. Merton, 
making a note of the intelligence. Then he recurred to his letter from the Home Office again. There is also a piece of a small key, broken in the futile attempt to open a desk. Well, well, nothing more of consequence. The letter is what we must rely upon. Mr. Davis said that Mr. Higgins told him. Miss Pratt began. Higgins! exclaimed Mr. Merton. N. S. Is it Higgins, the blustering fellow that ran away with Nat Hearn's sister? Yes, said Miss Pratt. But though he has never been a favourite of mine. N. S. repeated Mr. Merton. It is too horrible to think of. A member of the hunt, kind old Squire Hearn's son-in-law. Who else have you in Barford with names that end in N. S.? There's Jackson, and Higginson, and Blenkinsop, and Davis, and Jones. Cousin, one thing strikes me. How did Mr. Higgins know all about it, to tell Mr. Davis on Tuesday what happened on Sunday afternoon? There is no need to add much more. Those curious in the lives of the highwaymen may find the name of Higgins as conspicuous among those annals as that of Claude Duval. Kate Hearn's husband collected his rents on the highway, like many other gentlemen of the day, but having been unlucky in one or two of his adventures, and hearing exaggerated accounts of the hoarded wealth of the old lady at Bath, he was led on from robbery to murder, and was hung for his crime at Derby in 1775. He had not been an unkind husband, and his poor wife took lodgings in Derby to be near him in his last moments, his awful last moments. Her old father went with her everywhere, but into her husband's cell, and wrung her heart by constantly accusing himself of having promoted her marriage with a man of whom he knew so little. He abdicated his squireship in favour of his son Nathaniel. Nat was prosperous, and the helpless, silly father could be of no use to him. But to his widowed daughter, the foolish, fond old man was all in all. Her knight, her protector, her companion, her most faithful, loving companion. Only he ever declined assuming the office of her counsellor, shaking his head sadly and saying, Oh, Kate, Kate, if I had had more wisdom to have advised thee better, Thou needst not have been an exile here in Brussels, shrinking from the sight of every English person as if they knew thy story. I saw the White House not a month ago. It was to let, perhaps for the twentieth time since Mr. Higgins occupied it. But still the tradition goes on in Barford that once upon a time a highwayman lived there and amassed untold treasures and that the ill-gotten wealth yet remains walled up in some unknown concealed chamber, but in what part of the house no one knows. Will any of you become tenants and try to find out this mysterious closet? I can furnish the exact address to any applicant who wishes for it. End of the Squire's Story by Elizabeth Gaskell